Okay. You're good to go. Okay. Uh, very warm good evening to everyone. So today on 15th May 2023, we are organizing lecture 6 of uh, 7 days international webinar Itihas Saptaha 3.0 uh, with the theme Rewriting Her Story. So today's our resource person is Professor Dr. Amreshwar Gala, UNESCO Chair on Inclusive Museums and Sustainable Heritage Development, uh, Anant National University, Ahmedabad, Gujarat. And sir is going to talk on the title Daughters in Law in uh, Rethinking Heritage uh, Values. I warmly welcome you, sir, uh, to this uh, seven days international webinar. It's a privilege to have you today with us. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. I also welcome uh, our uh, Honorable President, Srinandan Shastri, sir and President Ms. Manali Momaya. I also welcome all the participants who are joining us uh, today through this session. Now I request Ms. Manali Momaya to introduce our today's resource person, Professor Dr. Amreshwar Gala, sir. Over to you, Man Manali. Thank you so much, Nadi. So it's an honor to have uh, Professor Dr. Amreshwar Gala with us here today uh, on this occasion. Uh, in fact, uh, we are celebrating International Museum Day a few days early because, uh, of course, all the museum uh, experts and the museologists will be extremely busy on the day of uh, the muse uh, International Museum Day. And uh, it will also be the eve of our uh, valedictory. So it might not have uh, gone so well. So we are celebrating it today uh, in advance. And uh, this year's theme of the International Museum Day is Museums, Sustainability and Wellbeing. And uh, on this occasion, we have uh, Professor Amreshwar Gala with us, UNESCO Chair on Inclusive Museums and Sustainable Heritage Development. Sir is an alumnus of the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi with a PhD from the Australian National University, Canberra. He is currently a Professor of Inclusive Cultural Leadership and Founding Director of uh, International Centre for Inclusive Cultural Leadership, Anand National University, Ahmedabad, uh, India. He is also the Founding Executive Director of the International Institute for the Inclusive Museum, uh, which uh, has operations in Australia, India and USA. Uh, he's formerly, he was formerly full professor of World Heritage and Sustainable Development at the University of Split, located in the World Heritage City of Split. Uh, first uh, full professor of museum studies in Australia at the University of Queensland, uh, Brisbane. And prior to that, uh, full professor and director of Sustainable Heritage Development Programs, Research School of Pacific and Asian Studies, Australian National University, Canberra. Uh, sir has extensive publication record uh, including the flagship project and publication World Heritage Benefits Beyond Borders, uh, which was published by the Cambridge University Press and UNESCO for the 40th anniversary of the 1972 uh, UNESCO World Heritage Convention launched in Kyoto, Japan, uh, 2012. Uh, with this brief uh, introduction of Sir, I now request Professor uh, Amreshwar Gala to uh, begin his talk on daughters-in-law in rethinking heritage values. Thank you. Thank you, Manale. Thank you, Nidhi, and thank you, Dr. Shastri. Thank you all, and thanks for everybody who is joined in. I know, know that quite a few people are joining on YouTube because I got messages from them, and uh, it's it's wonderful. I mean, wonderful in India the breadth of expertise that you've been able to profile in these three days is amazing. Um, when I left India four decades ago, this was not the same, you know, and now India has changed so much and with young Manali, the future, and she, as she smiles, I think it's wonderful. Hey, look, the, I had several people email me, message me, WhatsApp me saying, there's a mistake in the poster. Manali knows that. <laughs> you know, it's her story, but they keep, and I get messages saying, oh, there's a spelling mistake. 
Now that itself says something. Her story is so difficult to sink it, you know, for into people's minds, you know. And, uh, and I think it's really, it's it's high time, you know. The last year, the Durga Puja was inscribed on the world intangible heritage list. So what does it mean for women in India? What does it mean for women's narratives? It's one thing to have a world intangible heritage listed uh, element. I think we need to ask some serious questions. And uh, I'm going to start now. It's already eight minutes past nine. Banali, you said I could have maximum up to 30 minutes. OK, so I just want to stick to my time. Now, the thing is, it's International Museum Day uh, uh, on the eve of it, you know, and uh, sustainability and well-being is the main theme. But when we talk about sustainability, so many people think in terms of environmental sustainability. That's very dated. Uh, I mean, those of us who have been dealing with this, if you go to onsustainability.com, you'll see the largest sustainability research network that I launched 20 years ago, also the tier one uh, listed journal on sustainability. We've argued the four pillars, cultural sustainability, economic sustainability, social sustainability, and environmental sustainability. Somebody sent me a WhatsApp message saying, Ken, who is, is dealing with technology? Uh, spotlight on me. Is that OK? Because they can't see me. Uh, so you're uh, visible. I think there's no issue with the visual. The spotlight means I will be on the main screen. That's what they mean. Uh, yes, sir. You are on the main screen. Uh, Manali, just pin, sir. Pin, pin him. Um, so that, yeah, his screen will be. Okay, okay. I'll do that. Oh, it's just that we are already getting feedback. So that means people are engaged. While, while you try to do that, I'll continue. Uh, uh, all you have to do is spotlight. The spotlight on my picture. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the four pillars of sustainability are critical. And uh, culture, health, and well-being has been a theme that I've been dealing with all my life since at least 1984. And uh, sorry. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. No problem. Right. So culture, health, and well-being is something that I've been dealing with all my life. So I came back to India in 1984, sorry, 1940, sorry, 2014. I'm still in the last century, uh, 2014, December. And uh, not for staying, I just came for three months. And, and I just wanted to give something back to India where I was educated. All my education is in India, even though I have a PhD from a &M. And uh, one of the first things when I came back was uh, went straight to Amaravati, where my, where my parents were when I was born. And uh, and, they, and I was invited to come to a wonderful major co conference by, hosted by Andhra Pradesh government on Telugu culture language and heritage. And so I went to Vijayawada. There were 19 speakers on the podium sitting down. It was huge. There were thousands of people, 18 men and one woman. And, uh, and it so happened all the 18 men spoke for two and a half hours. And then the chair handed over to the only woman who was the then director of All India Radio Vijayawada and said to her uh, in Telugu, Madam, we are already late for dinner. Can you say what you want to say in two sentences? Now that, in a way, shocked the hell out of me. Coming back, you know, after having advocated for 40 years for access and equity. Uh, and so I went back to Amaravati and I just thought, what am I doing here in this place? This is so patriarchal, male chauvinist. What am I doing? And then my mother, I talked to my mother and she reminded me, remember, you always said that it's a question of what you can do and see what you can do. So there are two things 
that, that I thought of. Uh, one is actually understand Amaravati in terms of, uh, you know, its population profile. So I did an analysis of the social atlas of Amaravati. And, uh, and I found 53% of the population were women. And what is also more interesting is that I found that the Adapaditsu or the women who were born in Amaravati, they married men from outside, you know, Vijayawada, Guntur, Hyderabad, whatever, they left Amaravati, the majority, not all, the majority. And, uh, and then the women who were born elsewhere in other villages, towns, and so on, they married the local farmers and traders, they came to live in Amaravati. I thought this is really interesting, you know, this kind of marriage system. And so what does it mean in terms of if I'm going to spend a few more years in Amaravati and work with people, who am I working with? <clears throat> so I started walking the streets. I sound like a sex worker when I say that, but I was walking the every street, talking to people. Given my age and everybody thought I was a mad guy from Amara, from Australia coming back to a place like Amaravati, uh, I was able to talk to people. And I did that for three months. And then on the 8th of March 2016, uh, which is International Women's Day, I organized a, ma a major forum and uh, for International Women's Day. I remember... <clears throat> The director of the then director of All India Radio Vijayawada, who was the last, Krishna Kumari, who was the last to speak for two minutes uh, in Vijayawada conference. I brought her as the opening speaker. And the amazing, the director of the then director of SPA Vijayawada, Dr. Meenakshi, all these people came. So we had a fantastic forum. And, and that forum was attended by several women. Uh, aged between 23 and 96 from Amaravati. And about uh, 94 of them, you know, joined an informal group called Mavuru Makodalu. Mavuru means my village or my town. Makodalu means our daughters-in-law. And uh, only one of the daughters-in-law was born in Amaravati. So... So what I did was I said, look, okay, you're in charge of the museum with the whole of Amaravati, Amaravati Heritage Town, 300 acres of land. We declared it as an eco-museum. You are the eco-museologist. You're the local people. You're the keepers of your culture. You're the curators of your culture. Let's co-create what it is. Recording that in is, progress. What, what it is that is the culture of Amaravati. There was quite a bit of excitement, but also a little bit of resistance. And uh, because some farmers felt that I was marginalizing their sons. And, uh, and I said, no, I'm not marginalizing. They're farmers, they're working, they have no time to do anything at home. Women are there. So, the, so these women came together on several occasions. And, uh, and it was a slow process. And uh, so we did exercises like, uh, object analysis, significance of objects. So each one of them had to bring into the museum one object from their home that they thought had a significant heritage value. Vara uh, Sattva Viluva in Telugu. So value, you know, with, and uh, so they came into the museum with those objects. They talked about them to everybody else. Suddenly they started rethinking the museum rethinking heritage values, not as the tangible colonial legacy museum that's there in Amaravati on most parts of India. Colonial legacy of patterns of interpretation of heritage sites. But they started interpreting through the objects they brought in, you know, and, and their own approaches to what is heritage and what is history. And they felt really excited and they were so dynamic it was wonderful then they started inviting groups of people to their houses some of them were living in 19th century early 20th century houses which are their places so the daughters-in-law momentum started with this kind of approach 
uh, I receded into the background. I would stay in the background, and they would determine how they wanted to go about it. For example, they brought in 26 saris in which they married in their mother's village or town. But when they came to the museum, uh, when they came to Amaravati, they got dressed in the sari in which they were married to their mother-in-law's house. So they brought their saris into the museum to talk about them. So then, as it happened, I, I felt that we should do something about interaction with the rest of the remaining third, the then 13 districts of Andhra Pradesh. So I talked to the director of AP Culture and Creative Commission, and who is quite a well-known theater person, Dr. Vijay Bhaskar. And I said that, look, could you fund daughters-in-law who are artists from each one of the districts of Andhra Pradesh? He did. So we brought daughters-in-law from all the uh, from all the districts, and then we conducted an art camp. So the local daughters-in-law who could paint, who could draw, whatever, with the artists, daughter daughters-in-law from other uh, districts, they came together for three days. At the end of three days, on the fourth day, they exhibited what they produced. So we conducted three. Uh, art studios like this. Now, what this actually did was the whole idea was to give confidence to local daughters in law to express themselves, for them to welcome daughters in law from elsewhere, and uh, and to form to to find the kind of solidarity. But what's really interesting is by the following International Women's Day in 2017, when we organized another forum. The men, the husbands and the fathers-in-law, they started coming to the sessions to sit at the back. They probably say, oh, that is my daughter-in-law there. Not only that, I didn't have to ask the government for money because they're all farmers. So they started saying, here is one lakh rupees. You know, what else do you need? Do you need this? Do you need that? So they started funding the activities in the museum. And uh, so we started having a whole range of activities. And I won't go into all the details, but I'll give you some examples. Uh, we have a, a significant Dalit population in the village. Dalit girls are highly vulnerable. So the police sub inspector, who is actually a singer himself, who has been attending the workshops, he, he offered to do a workshop for the Dalit girls in the museum on respecting their culture, ensuring that other people respect their culture and ensuring that they are safe. So there's a whole workshop for uh, over 100 Dalit girls from high school in the museum for a whole day. And the daughters-in-law cooked things and brought them to the museum. So we never had to, very rarely, occasionally we did, but very rarely did we have to do any catering because the food was already brought from homes. And uh, so that was one activity about safety. Uh, in a museum as a civic space. That's the concept that since the 1960s has been around. And uh, so they came into the museum, they learned that about safety through the local sub-inspector. Another example that I give you is uh, there are the children uh, who are with 31 forms of disability in Amaravati. And what we found is that the girls the boys go to school, but the girls don't go to school. Why? So when we did the research, this is the role of museums. If they really want to make a fundamental shift in gender, gender approaches to do. So we did the research with the mothers, asking them why they don't send their daughters to school. They all said the same thing. They said, we would love to send them to school. It breaks our heart to see them at home bored. But if they go to school, the whole village, whole of Amrati will know that we got a girl with disability in our village. And then not only will she never get married, nobody else will get married in the family because people will say, you have disabilities in your family. So, so what did we do? We created a special purpose school in Amravati, uh, thanks to a headmaster who had spare rooms in his school and he allowed us to use them. But more than that, we organized an audit of the disabilities of the young people, both men and women, 
they're mostly women and uh, men and women or young girls and boys and and a group of doctors from Vishakhapatnam donated various supports very hearing aids whatever we needed so the doctors also volunteered in the museum and within about 3 months uh, you know people started you know getting their various supports for their you know for their whatever disability they have and uh, so the girls who were able to walk again they started going to school because they could walk they got their confidence so this all this is a museum project and this is a women's project mahuru ma kodalu and uh, a third example i want to give is uh, most of you would have heard about leopakshi which is uh, like a emporium for arts and crafts of andhra pradesh and uh, we hosted uh, another year we hosted for kartika mausam in november uh, a week long festival in the museum and uh, more and the hosts themselves were actually the daughters in law and uh, we had 200 and, i mean amaravati population is about 17600 dharnikota which is the ancient part of amaravati known as dhanya kataka dharnikota that has an equal amount of population but we had during that one week we had 270000 people come to the museum they they came not only to the museum they went to the shiva temple and because it's kartika mahotsav sacred time then we converted the gods into you, you know fashu aratis and shows uh, pancharati and so on. and again everything managed and uh facilitated by daughters in law but also amaravati had very poor roads in fact it was pathetic how bad it was so i raised through central government 9 point uh, sorry enough money for 9.1 kilometers of new roads and 1.5 kilometers of ghats along the river because very often during the mahashivaratri and other sacred times the people who drown are women because they are the because they have no proper guards they fall into the water they drown so we created you know uh, some of the best guards in india with high mast lamps and everything and uh, again central government uh, gave the money uh, by the way none of the projects we did hardly any of them got state government funding because we wanted to be at arms length from politics we wanted to focus on what we are doing and and it was a decision of the daughters in law so the important thing about the 1.5 kilometers of the ghats is that the daughters in law made a decision that diabetes is very high in amravati and dharnakota of course when i say amravati and uh, there is no there are no playgrounds there is no tracks there is no gymnasiums so no way to exercise but men go for walks but it's a sort of traditional village where it's very difficult for women to go for walks so we created the 1.5 kilometers of the ghats in such a way that women felt safe to go for walks to get exercise because women are also diabetic and this was another museum project so i won't give i won't go on giving you more examples but all i want to say is that um i'm so proud of the daughters in law that there was one woman trans woman gorgeous woman you know who used to carry water and uh, one day uh, we just by chance asked her if we could take a photo of her got her a photo got her a photo and then when i showed it to the daughters in law they all knew who she is and trans women were marginalized in amravati so they decided to host a special event with her a photograph on the banner in front of the museum and she was invited to that event and uh, so the daughters in law like i said 96 of them which formed the informal group uh, youngest was 23 the oldest was 94 she passed away last year and uh, they all came together they shared their knowledge intergenerational knowledge they were very passionate about articulating what they wanted to say now what 
happened before we started this project is there was no civic space, no club, no yoga club, nothing for women to get together. So the backyards in which they used to get together and talk in the traditional Madhava houses were all gone because they're all these concrete structures that have come up. So they, they don't want to sit outside in the front of the house. So, but in the museum, they started forming friendships, talking to each other. So women came out of their houses, thanks to the museum as a civic space to make friendships, networks, and so on. And what is also important is they, there were dancers. We, we, we had Kuchpudi classes. We had theater classes, many other classes. And I'll uh, tell you that the Kuchpudi dance, the first time we offered it, there were three Sunni women who came in with niqab to bring their daughters for the classes. And they were very proud of their da daughters learning Kuchpudi. And this is village India. If you don't politicize it, village India is very secular, everything is eclectic. And uh, so there were dancers, there were performers, there were speakers. Uh, daughters in law were asked to talk about their lives as women coming to Amaravati as a daughter in law. And we gave everybody a chance. When I say we, I really was insignificant. It's a, a, a core group of 26 daughters in law who facilitated everything. And, um, and we also had people coming and doing internships with us. Three Anand fellows from Anand National University came as interns, one from National Institute of Design. There were other people from Denmark, from Australia who came and stayed there. They were really interested in what we were doing. So it, how we started reinterpreting the culture and heritage of Amaravati is not through colonial gaze, because to most Indians, to most others, the moment you say Amaravati, they talk about the British Museum and Amaravati sculptures. Hello, there's a real Amaravati from where the British removed the sculptures. There are people, generations of people that live there. What about them? 300 acres of their heritage, life, cultural heritage landscape. What about that heritage landscape? What about all the others? And we have to think about, we have to really rethink. And finally, I want to say why I've got that image of Balisalam Matalli on the poster that you all got. Uh, Balisalam Matalli, Matalli means mother. She's a mother goddess. The old, the old uh, uh, Dhani Kota or Dhanya Kataka, 4th century BC, it was called Dhanya Kataka Emporium of Rice. And uh, you can see why Amaravati became significant under the Satavahanas as their eastern capital. She was the village uh, patron goddess. In a lot of villages, uh, at the entrance to the village, you have a mother goddess. And she becomes the patron goddess, the Grama Devata. And she was the, I won't go into all the detailed story about Balsla Bathali. You can go to my web page, inclusive museums, plural.org. There are articles written about Balsla Matali there, inclusive museums, plural, museums, plural, dot org. And uh, uh, so there are 12, we systematically worked, and then we found in the Sakali Peta, which is the Do Dobi Ghat area, if you will, Kumari Peta, which is the Potter's area, like that in different parts of Amrauti, Dharanakota, we found 12 mother goddess. Uh, temples. We started renovating them and I worked on the Balisla Matali, but the money for renovation came from the local villages, the local farmers, because those mother goddesses were not only important for local people, but one Balisla Matali, the image that you got, was significant for 23 surrounding villages. So people from all the 23 villages contributed to rehabilitating the place. And uh, and then you start getting the local stories. Otherwise, it's all hegemonic outside vision. And I stayed in Amaravati for nearly five years. It took me nearly two and a half years before I could actually get the Balsla Matali Guri going through the local people. They're raising the money. And their, their question was only one thing. Uh, and uh, if I 
as an Australian could come back to Amaravati and do what I'm doing for nothing, why can't they make, take care of their heritage themselves? And uh, so the 12 Mother Goddess Temples, also the Center for Mahayana Studies at Acharya Nagarjuna University, is doing research. Now, now they think that Buddhism never died out in Amaravati. Uh, these are the sites of Tantra and of Buddhism, these mother goddesses were Tantra and of Buddhist mother goddesses. So it's very interesting, it's very early days, because another myth that the Germans and the British spread in India is that Buddhism died out. I'm sorry, Buddhism didn't die out in India. B Buddhism was a protest movement among the Brahminical religions, but it transformed into other ways. Uh, and then you got Ladakh and many Himalayan foothills where Buddhism continues. And But we have this habit of parroting of what the British said, what the Germans said, that Buddhism died out in India. So we're doing research with the mother goddesses. We don't know as that for sure, but we need evidence. And uh, But also what's interesting is every archaeological site in Amaravati was protected by Archaeological Survey of India, Delhi. Balasalama Taliguri is the first heritage site, archaeological site, that, that is listed by the state government of Andhra Pradesh, who still have that 19, 19th century colonial antiquities act mentality. They, they don't see, they didn't see it as an antiquity. And, uh, but finally, thanks to a very wonderful IAS officer, uh, who now manages the governor of Andhra Pradesh, uh, Mr. Mukesh Kumar Meena, we managed to have it listed on the state list of heritage properties. So, but it was, you know, but again, it's daughters in law who worked as volunteers because the men as traders were busy during the daytime. The men as farmers were out on the fields during daytime and the women would get up early, cook, send up children to school, send up the husband to the farms, whatever, then come on to start working with us as volunteers during the day. By afternoon, 2.30, 3 o'clock, they would go home because the children come home from school. So now when we talk about employment and valuing, you know, creativity and culture, we should not forget what these women were doing needs to be valued as work, you know, they were actually more professional than a lot of professionals that I've come across because we train them. Once you train them in preventive conservation and things like that, they took to they took to it like you know, talk to ducks to water. They just loved it. But the objects that we borrowed, we ran some training workshops for them on looking after them. So when we returned them to their homes, that means we actually through the daughters-in-law brought in preventive conservation knowledge into all these homes across Amaravati Dharnakota. So I just wanted to share this with you, how in Amaravati, getting away from the gaze of the British Museum and the sculptures and the external gaze that so many Indians only think of in terms of colonial terms, we actually decolonize the heritage discourse through the daughter cinema. And, uh, now, what's happening there now? When Chandra Babu Naidu lost the election and Jagan became the chief minister, uh, all support was withdrawn and uh, because everything was attributed to Chandra Babu Naidu. To be quite honest, he had nothing to do with the daughters-in-law. In fact, he never came to a single event by the daughters-in-law. And yet, because it was done during the time of that chief minister, they lumped it as his agenda how ignorant both the civil servants are, how ignorant educated, so-called educated public are. And, but however, out of the 20 spaces that we worked on in the Amrath Heritage Town, there are nearly 18 that continue to be maintained by the local communities because they, they raised the funds for it. But the two main ones, the Amrath Heritage Center and Museum, part of it has become a bar now. You can go and get drunk. If you want, can you imagine it's meant to, it's a state museum which is used as a bar. And uh, another one that we had nothing to do with is also struggling. And uh, but the daughters in law keeping. Now I want to finish up by saying I started off by saying these daughters in law, most of them came from other villages and towns. 
So when they came to Amaravati, they set up the home. Right? They set up the home, they even embroidered the curtains, everything, you name it. They had children. They brought up children. They, they cooked for the children grandma's recipes from their village. They sang lullabies from their grandma. They told stories from their grandma, all from their villages. Right? But these children were born in Amaravati, brought up by their mothers who came from other villages. So in terms of intergenerational transmission, there was a seamless transmission of intangible heritage from other villages to the children in Amaravati. So when we talk about culture in Amaravati, what are we talking about? We're talking about women's culture. And that's what we profile in the project. I'm writing it up as a book, and uh, but I just wanted to share it with you. It doesn't mean that we weren't dealing with the mass super we did, uh, we did all the tangible heritage items, but from a women's perspective, not from a patriarchal male perspective. In the end, we ha we hope to get a balance of both the perspectives, and we need a hybrid approach, a fusion to appreciate our sense of place and identity in Amravati. That's where I'm going to stop, but I'm very proud of being part of Mauru Ma Kodolu, the daughters in law group. One thing I must say, I really enjoyed is uh, because I, I was an elderly man living back from Amaravati, they all fed me. So I got fed the best food ever in India by all my daughters in law. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Indeed, it was a wonderful lecture. Uh, thank you so much. We have a question in the chat box from uh, Srinandan Shastri, sir. Uh, the question is, Professor Amar, you had stayed in Amravati for five years. Likewise, have you stayed in countryside in Australia or Europe? How do you compare the enthusiasm of daughter-in-laws worldwide uh, in context of intangible heritage? That is the question. Sir. Ooh, that's a big question. And uh, uh, the countryside in Amravati is very different from the countryside in Australia. Australia is an invaded, colonized uh, country where the indigenous people are completely displaced. It's only now they're getting recognition. So you can't compare the two. And uh, But I did live in the countryside. I lived near a place called Kuma on a farm for several months, and I spent a lot of time driving around Australia. Um, the daughters-in-law in Australia are also disempowered like daughters-in-law in India. Uh, Australia has very high incidence of domestic violence because of isolation, very different reasons from India. You know, it's a huge country, three times the size of India with not even one time the population of Calcutta. And, uh, and with only 26 million people, distributed population, women get isolated, families get isolated for different reasons. And, uh, but there are country women's associations in Australia which where the women come together they're fantastic to work with. I've worked with them on a prison museum um, uh, in, called the Pioneer Women's Hub, which was recycled prison, abandoned prison stone that we used to build a prison museum. They're fantastic to work with. But it's a different kind of volunteerism and uh, something that I'm not uh, familiar being systematic in India, but there's a lot of volunteerism in India too. I mean, like the Mahurama model is about volunteerism. I lived in Denmark and I lived in South Africa for five years, worked in South Africa for five years. And I think that each country has got its own narratives and its own histories. The daughters-in-law, very different. I mean, because they're culturally and linguistically diverse. I mean, India might be culturally and linguistically diverse, but it's only second to Papua New Guinea because Papua New Guinea is the most culturally and linguistically diverse country in the world. And uh, so when you look at daughters-in-law, for example, in Manipur, they're very different from daughters-in-law in Rajasthan or, uh, or Andhra Pradesh or Gujarat. Uh, so it's very difficult to compare, but, but I think that solidarity is important, civil society mechanisms are important, you get country women's associations, women's clubs in Western countries. 
in India, you know, there are many informal networks, self-help women's groups that are bringing women together, especially daughters-in-law. So I could go on, but I'll stop there in case there's another question, maybe. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. So I had a small question. Uh, in India, so when uh, uh, when a daughter-in-law enters the house, so a totally new culture uh, enters the uh, uh, you know family, and uh, earlier culture uh, which will be given by a mother to her son or uh, earlier culture, uh, there will be bit uh, changes or transitions. Uh, and it will be left back. It may be in the recipes or it may be worshipping the god or goddesses or anything, living style. Uh, so, uh, sir, uh, how do you want to interpret this? Is it a negative aspect or uh, what you want to say on maybe, this? Maybe you said it's a small question. Let's make it a big question because it is a big question. Um, yeah. Uh, there's there are certain stereotypes. I don't know you you saw you're from Karnataka, right? Yes. Have you heard of Ramen Srinivas? Uh, no, sir. He's one of the most famous sociologists, not only in India, the world. Okay. And he, he died in Bangalore. He did his life lifetime research in Kurg and also Karnataka. He, there's a book by him called The Remembered Village. It's available in India extensively. I would strongly recommend that you see if you can access it, the remembered village. There are a lot of answers for the kind of question that you asked. Uh, but my own experience is, yes, the daughter comes in from a different cultural context, right? And, uh, and of course, Pelit Supulu, when their marriage arrangements are being made, you know, parents cross-check so many things, you know, compatibility, you know, cultural values and so on, despite that the daughter in law is a new house. But what I found is that, in fact, she, her cultural values are not completely negative. Some mother-in-laws try to do that, but it doesn't always work. And uh, so there's a fusion that's what my concluding remark was. They bring their own values from their mother's place, the grandmother's place, to the new houses and the changes that take place. The fusion, it, it's evolving. See, intangible heritage is living, it's dynamic, it's, it's, it's not a dead culture. So what they bring is adapted. Uh, the home co host culture in the new home is adapted and uh, there are various pro protocols and so on and so forth. But of course, this varies from community to community. I also worked in the Dalit colony in, um, in Dharnakota. In the Dalit colony, the women are far more, uh, you know, egalitarian, you know, sort of them, they got more rights than the, you know, than the women in some of the Vaishya street, Brahmin street, you know, other farming streets. So it also varies, you know, when we say, I already said India is such a big culturally and linguistically diverse country. Uh, Amarati is also very culturally and linguistically diverse. And, uh, and also uh, having been, it being my birthplace and I speak the local language, understand the different dialects because you've got three different types of, types of indigenous people or scheduled tribes there. And uh, so I could understand Chenchu Yanadi, Erikla, all the three groups, they were highly marginalized. And the daughters in law ensured that, that these children from those tribal groups could go to school by raising money. So it, it was all pervasive what the daughters in law could do. But that hybridity is what we call culture, continuously evolving its dynamic. I hope I answered your question. If you asked a very big question. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you. Nali, you don't have a question? Uh, no, sir. Actually, I was enjoying your talk. And uh, it might take some time for me to have questions. And I will definitely communicate them to you. Um, in fact, I do have some right now. But uh, as we are running late for the next 
as the president asked me one question um okay sir sure uh, so you uh, actually i was very curious in the beginning when you gave me the title uh, daughters in law and rethinking heritage value so um, i was curious as to what the word daughters in law means in this context and uh, after listening to your talk uh, that question is gone that curiosity has now been um, satisfied uh, but my question is uh, when we uh, as you said culture is an evolving uh, uh, it's a living being uh, is it really a bad thing when some of the older culture is lost some things are not actually very um, good they should not be preserved and some things yeah. can be adopted from a new culture so is it really bad when that happens very big question again absolutely not not bad at all i'm all for dowry system to die i'm all for discrimination against women to die there are a lot of aspects you know in our cultural system see the thing is it's also called intangible heritage but not all intangible heritage is good not all cultural values are good so if certain things die i mean like for instance the discrimination against dalits why there is a dalit colony separate housing uh you know that kind of discrimination is a bad culture it needs to die so when we renovated the temple with eight and a half crores nearly 9 crores of rupees uh and uh, it's the god is called amareshwar amarlingeshwar amareshwar and and i always saw the conservation of the temple because it dates back to 13th century ad actually dates back to about 7th century ad but the core of it but the substantial part of it and then the sri krishna devaraya times then it was expanded i always saw the whole thing so i knew the pujari is really well so when we reopen the temple once again for another kartik masam i came with dalit people and the pujari is bless them the same way they bless me and it's all a question of learning how to open the doors in india people talk about access it rolls up their tongue so quickly but they don't know how to open the doors it's all a question of opening the doors so i'm totally with you there are many aspects like you're not sending daughters to school because they got some form of disability is a bad cultural habit we we need dowry is bad and uh, so uh, i wouldn't go as far as saying forced marriage marriages which are arranged are also bad because i i, I don't want to get involved because i want to go back to amaravati <laughs> i don't want to be beaten up no they won't do that they love me it's a place where everybody loves me thank you so much for your question i really appreciate it remember when we talk about safeguarding intangible heritage you know female genital mutilation is bad intangible heritage dowry is bad intangible heritage caste based discrimination is bad you know uh, so there are lot of or even uh, aniloma pratiloma marriages which you probably understand you know that system of aniloma pratiloma marriages is also bad cultural system you got to get rid of it so keep keep it there it's up to your generation manali you got a long you're very young so you can change the world yes. uh, definitely so that uh, that is our uh, ultimate hope that we can create some change and uh, we will definitely uh, do our bit in that um, and uh, with the inspiration of uh, uh, leaders like you i think uh, it will be possible for us So thank, thank you, you so everybody. much for this uh, absolutely wonderful and um, thought provoking and intriguing lecture and uh, if i do have any other questions i will uh, get in touch with you sir surely please reach out no problems yes sir yeah uh, so um as we are uh, yes sir why log out now uh, sure sir as we are running late i just uh, i want to just thank you on behalf of my team and uh, all our uh, Uh, participants of the webinar uh, for this wonderful uh, uh, for the time wonderfully spent with us uh, thank you so much once again so thank you thank you for having me thank you very yes, much sir. and uh, now moving on to our next uh, uh, lecture for the day uh, i welcome 
श्री शिव प्रसाद खेनेर सर टू दी जूम मीटिंग टू द सिक्स सेवेंथ लेक्चर ऑफ इतिहास सप्ताह थ्री पॉइंट ओ आई रिक्वेस्ट निधि टू काइंडली शेयर द ब्रोशर ऑन स्क्रीन Then we can have a move on. The next one. Good evening, sir. Ah, yeah, good evening. Sorry for the delay, sir. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, it happens. Nadi. the 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 poster is gone uh yes uh just give me one second uh, when i i while i stop this sure 